Have you ever wondered what helped to shape the person you are today? So the decisions that you make, the habits that you hold, how you like to spend your time, with who and where. Even your deeply held beliefs, your ideology and your identity. What helped to create those? Many of us might like to believe that we are masters of our own destiny, but increasingly, neuroscience is challenging that idea. We can now peer into the brain and see how vast swaths of our complex behavior are biologically ingrained. And for me, what all this touches on and dances around are some key questions about what it means to be human. It's about fate, it's about free will, and it's about our brains. And to kickstart our exploration of these great topics, I'd like you to listen to this. Complete gobbledygook, right? Okay, now take a listen to this. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. Poor camel. Okay, now we're going to revert to the original file. <laughs> and suddenly, your brain makes sense of it. It's because the two files have a similar cadence or frequency, and your brain is overlaying the sense sentence onto the incoming gobbledygook. This helps us to understand how our brains operate as prediction machines. We use our past experiences our wisdom, our knowledge, as a foundation or a lens, a prism by which to view incoming information. And that creates our current sense of reality, our perception of the world. And it's that which then helps us to decide how to act in the future and how our life stories are created. Now, this concept helped me to understand my life trajectory. I used to work as a nursing assistant in a psychiatric hospital. I was working with children that had been detained and sectioned under the Mental Health Act. I fondly remember how they used to play basketball in the courtyards. They used to enthusiastically bang on the bongo drums in music sessions, or they'd be quietly reading Harry Potter in a corner. But my overriding memory of the place is a feeling of deep claustrophobia and frustration for the children. Their constant battle with medication-induced lethargy. The experience created in me a deep desire to find out more about the brain and behavior in an effort to try and discover new treatments that might help these children and others. And so I joined a growing army of neuroscientists, and I did a PhD in neuropsychiatry and became a fellow in order to understand more about the brain. Now, the brain is generally now agreed to be our organ of destiny. It's this majestic organ that only weighs about 1.5 kilograms, so that's just 2% of your total body mass. And yet it magically conjures up all of your thoughts, your emotions, and instructs you to interact with the world in the way that you do. And it does this via 86 billion nerve cells. 86 billion, that's a high number. It's about 14 and a half times the number of people on this planet in terms of nerve cells in your brain. And even more incredible is that each one of these nerve cells connects to up to 10,000 other nerve cells in order to create the most intricate electric circuit board imaginable with around 100 trillion connections in it. Now, why am I calling it a circuit board? Because each one of those nerve cells uses the power of electricity, pumping sodium and potassium ions in and out of the membrane across the whole circuit of your brain in order to dictate your emotions, your behaviors, and allow you to process information. And there's a lovely, albeit slightly mean, experiment that helps demonstrate the power of electricity in our nervous system. So this is an electric shock panel. And if we apply it to a nerve cell, not in my brain, but into my body, there's a collection of nerve cells called the ulnar nerve tract, which runs from shoulder to wrist to control movement in my hand. It's usually under the control of the motor cortex here. What we're going to do is apply a small electric shock to the ulnar nerve through the skin, switching it on and off and on and off. And this is happening 
quite quickly. So the electricity, the signal is being conveyed about speeds of 120 miles an hour, and it's now causing some pain and distraction for me. Um, now, around 100 or so years ago, a new field of cartography started mapping not the oceans or the land or the skies, but mapping the nerve cells in our bodies and the muscles that they innovate. Skip forwards to today, and we're now starting to map these connections within our mind, this neural circuitry of our brain. And what that information is telling us is that we can now start to use this map and employ it on people that have been suffering for many years from symptoms of depression or obsessive compulsive disorder or heroin addiction. These patients opt to undergo brain surgery and have a minuscule version of this electric shock panel embedded deep in discrete regions and circuits within the brain to apply an electric current which will instantaneously switch off their symptoms, offering real relief to people that have been suffering for years. But was there anything about these people's brains that predisposed them to suffering this way? We're actually also living in a genomics revolution. So we can now sequence really quickly the 3.2 billion base pairs that makes up our individual blueprint for life, our DNA code. And what this sequencing information is telling us is that there's huge numbers of our complex behaviors that are also biologically ingrained. So not just our predisposition to mental ill health, but also complex traits like our intelligence or how long we might live. There's a high genetic biological element to this. It might be hundreds or thousands of genes working in tandem. And the majority of these genes are involved in dictating how that neural circuitry is laid down in the first place. In exciting new technological developments, we can now even peer into the brain as it's being built. And what scientists are finding is that in the human brain, 20 weeks before the birth of a baby, you can see these anatomical signatures, these changes in the brain that correlate with the genes that predispose to symptoms as complex as autism or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, or even symptoms that might not emerge for decades down the line. Major depressive disorder, bipolar, or even schizophrenia. You may have heard of the phrase, you're wired that way. Well, it's not just a metaphor. And there's another new, exciting area of research called epigenetics that's helping us to understand exactly how utterly intertwined nature and nurture can be. And there's a lovely example that helps us to appreciate this. So mice usually love the sweet smell of cherries. A waft of it reaches their nose, and it sends an electric signal from the nose to the nucleus accumbens, the region that's involved in pleasure motivating the mice to scurry around in order to hunt out this sweet treat. Now, researchers wafted in the smell of cherry and then shortly afterwards applied a mild electric shock. And very quickly, the mice associated these memories and learnt to freeze in anticipation of a shock whenever they smelt cherries. After this, the researchers let the mice be. They had a wonderful, happy life. They settled down, had children. Those pups left home, and they went on to have nice lives and have children of their own. So now we're talking about the grandchildren of the original mice. And it seems as though this traumatic memory had cascaded across the generations via biology. There was a change in the grandfather's sperm, not in the code itself, but in the shape of its DNA. And this shape change altered the way that enzymes could access different genes within that sperm, and that affected the way that the neural circuitry of the pups and the grand pups' brain circuit was put together. And this sent the electric circuit from the nose, rerouting it to the amygdala, a different brain region that's involved in the fear response. 
And so the pups learnt through this mechanism to be highly sensitive to the smell of cherries. Okay, but how does this relate to us humans? Well, prisoners of war from the US Civil War, when they return home and have children, their sons have an 11% higher mortality rate by the age of 42 compared to descendants of other veterans. And in a very fascinating but very small study, those people that survived the Holocaust, their descendants carry an epigenetic mark of the memory. There's a change in the way that the gene for cortisol, a hormone that's involved in the stress response, is expressed. Okay, so our fate, our destiny, can be written into our DNA, entwined in the way that it's structured and expressed, and we can carry memories across generations. But thankfully, not all of our fate is written in stone in its entirety. There is still potential for change. And this occurs via this wonderful mechanism called plasticity. As you learn something new, a new connection forms between one nerve cell and another. As that learned thing becomes a memory, it becomes the default route within your brain by which to process information, and it becomes a stable connection. And what you can see in this movie here are proteins being shuttled across a nerve cell to help with that laying down of new memories within the mind. And that new passageway of thinking can then become a habit in your behavior. But it's not as simple as that. Sometimes it can be very difficult to allow people to change their minds and to think in a new way, to learn from their environment afresh. And this is a neat illusion that helps demonstrate that point. So when we get to the back end of this hollow mask, the shadow information is telling us that the eyes and the nose are pointing backwards. But we're used to seeing faces in our environment, and so we ignore those shadow cues and just see another face pointing out. In this way, we can start to understand how our brains make assumptions based on our past experiences. And sometimes those assumptions can be so inbuilt into our identity that in order for us to see the world afresh, it would require widespread demolition and rebuilding work. And it can be sometimes just too costly. For me, there's something quite beautiful about viewing all of our behaviors as this simple output, this mechanistic processing of all the information that's coming in from the outside world, being overlaid by our cartography, our unique DNA code that sculpted our brain to give rise mechanistically to our behaviors and our views. And also, there's some promising research coming out of neuroscience in the fields of resilience and finding out how we can cultivate a more flourishing brain. And this gives me hope for some of the children that I was talking about earlier on. Also, as a first-time parent, I find this neuroscience knowledge empowering. Rather than constantly worrying about how I can hone my son's developing brain, I find it reassuring to think that actually what's done is done. His brain is his. And rather than worry in this age of parental anxiety, actually, I should just sit down and play with him. But biological determinism rightly makes people nervous. There's been some abhorrent acts, genocide and eugenics. But perhaps neuroscience knowledge should be used instead by each of us to start to appreciate how evolution has provided us with this organ that allows us to display this vast breadth of behaviors for each one of us on this planet to have a very unique and individual cartography of the mind, which gives rise to very different behaviors and very different views. And actually, maybe we should appreciate this neurodiversity because it's only when we start to pull all of that individual different ways of thinking that we can truly harness the collective cognitive capacity that we as a species 
are capable of.